What's up, buddy? What's up, coach? How are you? Good, man. How are you doing? Uh, pretty good. Pretty good. Not a bad weekend. Eating too much uh, turkey and dressing the last few days, but other than that, pretty solid. Yeah, same here. Same yeah, here. I heard. I heard the balls lost. Oh my goodness. I did. I honestly, man, I didn't even watch a snap. Yeah, it was. Uh... It was painful, okay. and I can't yeah. imagine the aftermath. I haven't looked or anything, but it's got to be brutal. Yeah, I uh, I went to bed at like seven, and I was putting Hayden to bed at like six thirty, and because I was up at like three, and uh, woke up once, and he was uh, and I think we were up twenty four seventeen when I woke up once, and and to take care of Hayden, and then I think I remember waking up at like three, and I was like, yeah, you guys lost. I was like, yeah, you know. That's not surprising the way the season's gone. What a turn of events, man. I know that everybody was going into this with the highest of expectations, and now they have. Okay, so that's actually a good uh, way to lead into this, I think. Um, what are you going to say if you're the coach, man? How do you keep motivated? Man, for one bowl game, uh, you know, I honest, I think it's uh, for your seniors, it's how do you want to go out? How do you want to be remembered? Do you want to go out as a, you know, losing to Vanderbilt, although it is your rival? You know, it is just one game, and you can go out with a win. It won't be, you know, as you expected, but, you know, it's your job as a leader and a, and a, either a senior on the team or a junior looking to jump to the draft that, you know, you don't want to – people always look at how you handle yourself in adversity or during, you know, and they don't uh, – in, in NFL scouts look at that kind of stuff too. You know, one of the things they'll look at Jalen Hurd for he'll look at how he quit on his team during the middle of the year. Yeah. Um, and they're gonna they're gonna criticize him for that. I mean, the guy also <laughs> you know, the the guy switched high schools three times. You know, he's just a guy that doesn't uh doesn't seem to ever like his current situation and thinks that moving on to a different situation is always better than just handling it different himself. Yeah, walking and away. So, yeah, then walking away. You know, so I always think that uh you know that's how you approach it with your seniors, and you know the the lower classmen. You know injuries aside, you know it's you know build and get better for next year. You know it, it's it's a uh, it's all linear. It's more about your career at that point than it is a season. You right. know set yourself up good for camp the next year, but um, yeah, I don't know. He's a Butch is a great recruiter, but I think he has a he has trouble uh, connecting with his team. I think that's his biggest downfall. Yeah, I wonder if. Uh... And I think this is valid because I wonder if he, you know, you always see these guys that are great recruiters and kind of like, you know, they turn into, I wonder if they run into that conflict of being too much of a buddy and, you know, because they're saying whatever they need to say to kind of get them in there and it's sort of like build up the stars on the recruiting class and then you get to the point where you can't be too hard on them maybe sometimes because you've promised certain things or whatever you got you kind of overextend yourself as a promiser um so i mean you talk about as a coach i just think that as we go in like the podcast here we're going to talk about your philosophy as coaching in coaching and as a coach i noticed that you were i mean we were really good friends but you had an ability to distance yourself from that as my coach in the arena of training so in general do you want to talk about, you know, maybe your general philosophy on uh, coaching and specifically as it relates to Ironman training or triathlon training? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first off, I mean, I think is your memory. I know you're getting you're getting up there in age. I yeah. know your memory is getting kind of <laughs> odd. We, I don't think we ever did. We even speak the per, before the first time we met. I mean, I, from my recollection, it wasn't the first time we met at. Uh, uh, at Calypso Cafe with yes. the other four guys. Yeah, uh, I think you were the first one there. Uh, you rolled up on your motorcycle with your toboggan and your little leather jacket, and, uh, <laughs> and we didn't speak much before the other guys got there because I knew them uh, obviously more than you. And I remember thinking, "Oh, Jesus, who's this old dude trying to get into triathlon? And how am I going to get him to? <laughs> how am I going to? Man, I mean, and to be fair, this it's not a big jump from." Rocking and from what rocking leather to rocking spandex, so I knew there was, it wasn't going to be that much of a jump. <laughs> well, you know, it's one bike to another, man. It is, man. It's a, it's two wheels and and passion. Uh, 
But no, I, I, it's it's a great subject, and t- today's a good day for me to touch on it as I, I uh, had the opportunity to speak with a, a new athlete uh, for the first time earlier today. Um, and so some of these kind of questions and thoughts are kind of fresh in my mind. Um, you know, I, I, I don't, uh, I think coaching philosophy and coaching, uh, I think it's kind of a, a bit, not a buzzword, but I think it kind of gets, people try to make it too elaborate and too wordy and throw in, throw in things like, you know, I'm a high performance coach. I coach elite athletes. Uh, we are, you know, elite performance base. I'm like, it's, that's, you know, all fine and dandy. And that's more of a result than it is a philosophy. You know, I would just say that my general approach to coaching is that I prefer to build a coach athlete relationship Uh uh, that's focused on trust, communication, um, and, you know, first and foremost, just being able to put the sport of triathlon uh, aside to where it's not necessarily our main focus. Um, it's a vessel in which we use it to for you to get better. And if you're if you're committed to the process of just finding out how good you can possibly be, then the results speak for themselves. Um, but you know, I think, especially in this day and age where people take the sport so seriously and it seems like every other age group person you talk to is, is quote unquote sponsored, um, you know, which I'm not sure what their definition of sponsor is, but if you pay for something, you're not sponsored. Um, you know, where everything is, you have to hashtag 20 different things after your, after your workout to make sure you, you oblige by these, uh, so called so on you know so called sponsors that you kind of get you just take yourself too seriously mm-hmm. and uh, and and the the athlete that I just uh, began working with earlier today was her first conversation is she uh, actually chose to go with me instead of uh, a, f- a few other coaches because of my approach that that triathlon is a sport you know it is not our life. You know, mm-hmm. it is not something we make money at, and, and that that I was going, or that she trusted me to focus on it, complementing her life rather than consuming it. Mm-hmm. Um, she came from a, you know, you see this a lot, uh, and a lot of my athletes come from an, a previous triathlon background where you have an Ironman. She had an Ironman two years ago, and just got got a training plan, but didn't get coaching. Mm-hmm. got burnt out it wasn't a great experience and you know uh yeah i just think that people make a lot of false promises and give you cookie cutter training plans and you know what i really like to do is is establish like i said establish a relationship built on trust and communication and uh that's where i can kind of use my experience and my knowledge um integrate that with your life and your situation and the things that you have to say you know because i, I it's it's more important for me to listen than it is for you to listen. You know, you trust me to give you what, to give you the prescribed workout and training load that I deem necessary. But if I don't listen, then I'm not going to know that. And so I think that's probably one of the biggest areas that I focus on on telling people my approach is, you know, like, you know, just listening to you and who you are helps me develop the right plan to help you succeed. Yeah. And as I think back to the beginning of our relationship, again, as a coach-athlete relationship, I always, you know, had a lot of questions because um, it was obviously new to me. But what I noticed about how and what appreciated about how you handled it was that I would throw stuff out there. And I feel like you knew me well enough, you know, whether it was through discussions or hanging out or just talking about other stuff to know if I was... uh, kind of loafing or if I was bullshitting versus I was really maybe sore or something was bothering me and you knew how to um, motivate me and a lot of times it was um, by you know letting me stew on something or something you know a simple thing like that you know I might be just a little frustrated or whatever and I knew you're there but you know sometimes you just would let me figure it out and that's a huge part of coaching too to me is is that you have to understand who you're working with so I'm glad that you get 
close enough to these athletes to really understand their, you know, the, what makes them tick and how they operate best. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really, you know, it's it's you're you may you're managing people, mm-hmm. you know, you're managing personalities, you're managing emotional and mental, um, you know, parts of their of them that are delicate that, you know, coaches. It's not. You know, you usually have two, you know two different kinds of coaches. A coach is who's going to push you and challenge you physically, mm-hmm. and that's how they get across their message. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, hammer meets nail. Or you're going to have a coach, which I consider myself as one who's going to challenge you, and um, you know, really kind of put you in uncomfortable situations emotionally and mentally, to where you have to really just kind of critically think. Um, and figure things out on your own. Yeah. You know, is it going to be more beneficial for for you, the athlete, for me to give you something? To, you know, oh, you need to suck it up today. You need to go work out and do this workout and just get over it. Or is it going to be more beneficial for me to talk to you about what's going on, figure out some resolution, and then maybe see how I can, you know, not really manipulate it, mm-hmm. but – but it kind of is manipulate the conversation to where you have to internally figure out how bad do I want this and how, how can I make this work? Because if you can do that on your own, then the chance of, of you having a sustainable career in triathlon or as a hobby and our relationship is going to flourish because you can figure it out intrinsically before I even have to do anything. I mean, I'll, I'll, um, I won't use her name, but I had to have a conversation with an athlete earlier today where I just had to flat out say, you know, listen, your biggest your biggest obstacle in the sport of triathlon is that you never think you do anything good enough. Wow. She is so hard on herself all the time. You know, and I had to simply say, listen, you are a fantastic mother. You're a fantastic wife. You have come so far in the sport because she beats herself up all the time. You yeah. know, and, and she, you know, she struggles with just not feeling like she's doing good enough. And, you know, and, and at that point, we need to kind of take a step back and you know, say, all right, let's, how can I, you know, I'm not a therapist, but you kind of are as a coach. Sure. Um, you know, and say, hey, how can I help you? get to a point where you don't feel that way or how can I create a plan to where you feel these daily wins and they don't just feel like monotony you know I've been with I've been with this athlete for almost four years you know and so it's not like we you know we have a, a very new you know relationship I know it, it, everything there is to know about her life basically and she knows the same about mine mm-hmm. and and that's what and I, I guess that's kind of where I uh, I really love the aspect of coaching because you're coaching people, you mm-hmm. know. You're these people put these tremendous goals in your hands and expect you to give them the training and the guidance. But the most the most fun and the most rewarding part is the journey. It's not the race. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's the little this text messages I get during the week. This is oh man, I can't believe I was able to do this workout. And I did it. Yeah. You know, cause the race is the race, and you're gonna get, you're gonna do as well as you, as you, as you earned, as the work you put in. But it's like the journey leading up to it. You'll remember bits and pieces about the race, but you'll remember so many other things about the journey. And so, if I can make that journey fun and exciting, and a learning experience, um, then it's a win. It's a total win. Yeah. Um. And, and I do like that, uh, you know, with it, again, speaking directly about our relationship as an athlete and coach, um, I like the way that you, like, I'm totally different than that w- woman you just described, you know, like, I, I kind of think that everything I do is awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of the problem. That, that's kind of the problem. So it's a, it's a 180, but you handle it really well. I mean, you know that um, I have my own theories and I like to go off on my own road, but in our coaching relationship, a lot of time, I just look at it as sort of like you look at what I'm doing and you try to figure out how to make that more effective or efficient for me. And you're, you're not over there just like laying down workouts for me all the time and training plans that are inflexible. It's, it's a matter of 
evolving with me because you know I'm kind of stubborn like that and um, I haven't quite figured it out and I totally realize that so maybe I should lean more towards your philosophy <laughs> <laughs> well you know it's 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 the uh, you know there's also an aspect of coaching which is which is really has a lot of the same aspects of, of sales mm-hmm. and when I mean sales I don't mean um, I'm trying to sell you on being an athlete or I'm trying to sell you on a training plan it's you know at the ultimate kind of center of selling, you want to get you want to get a person to make a decision, mm-hmm. and let them think it's their idea. Yeah, um, that they are control, and that's the same thing with coaching sometimes with certain people. And, and I'd use you as an example, as you have these uh, you know visions and philosophies and and approaches you like to take to training, um, you know, and they might differ, but if and I might think you might need to go a different direction, but I can't say that. I need to enter into the discussion maybe a different way of thinking that's worded differently so that you kind of gravitate towards how it better fits into your philosophy versus a change in philosophy, um, you know, c- coaching-wise. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that's a, that's a delicate balance you have to take with people is that, you know, they – is getting people to do things that either they never thought possible – or getting people to do things that they don't want to do by getting them to think it's their own idea. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or, you know, and that, that's another huge part of coaching. If that person struggles from a motivation standpoint or, uh, you know, since some, some athletes just like to question, like, you know, I, I don't, why are we doing this? Why is this? You know, I have athletes who never question at all. They just do what they're told 24-7. I have other athletes who want to ask why. Why is this? Why is that? Why are I only swimming twice this week? Why am I swimming three times this week? You know, I only like to give one week blocks at a time because it lets me really create a customized and individual training plan. But for an athlete who starts to question the direction and where we're going and how we're going to accomplish things, um, sometimes what I'll do is kind of map out a skeleton of four weeks and say, here's what we're doing this week and this is how it's going to fit into weeks two and three and then we get to a recovery week so let's now you can because some people can't look at the small picture they have to see the big picture that's just the way their their brain works they just struggle seeing you know just a week so i can show them a, a whole four week block and say listen here's where we're headed i'll change it if we need to but this is why your first monday is this and your last sunday is this and it might be 30 days away, but this is how it works within the same program. Um, and it's just being, and it's also being comfortable with yourself. Like for me, you know, I've, I am super comfortable changing an athlete's plan that day or totally changing the week. Um, because I have to be confident enough in myself that I can, based on my experience and my research and my education, that I can make it work no matter what. You know, and not say, all right, here's your four week block, do it every day in a row, because that's the only way I know how to coach. You know, and you see a lot of people like that. And I've had athletes come to me saying, you know, my coach just wasn't, didn't want to change my plan. And, you know, a lot of coaches have communication limiters based on how much you pay. And some people think, oh, well, they just don't want to, they don't want to communicate that much and change my plan that much that's rarely the case more often than not it's that coaches only have this certain way to coach right and if you don't fit in that mold then you're it's not going to work you know and and so what i like to do is find a personality and a person that i can connect with and the rest is gravy because i can i can by all means connect with that person on a on a great level that is like I, could, I if I can hear myself establishing a friendship with you and being like totally invested in your journey and, and why you're doing it, or you're doing it for the right reasons, then everything else comes easy. You know, and it's something that I can get passionate about. Um, and that that's my favorite part, my yeah. favorite part of coaching. And I, again, I think that sort of relates back to what we were talking about earlier with college football coaching. I think a lot of times coaches go athlete first and character second and or you know how they're going to gel second 
and that ends up causing problems in the long run. I'm not, I'm no, I, I can I can already hear the Wisconsin basketball finale <laughs> coming. I can <laughs> I can smell saying. it from like ten miles away. I mean, you're, you're so predictable. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it's a it's you know you can say what you want about it, but um, how else you know does a team? And I am a Wisconsin fan. I'm a total homer, but I have learned a lot by watching them the last 20 years because they have traditionally pulled in three-star athletes, and they are perpetually in the top 15 every year. And I mean, what's what uh, what's the other explanation? It's just a consistency that uh, I think so many other teams just like fall off rails and and give up on, you know, and you know, a lot of times like. Sometimes it takes a little while for that relationship to develop as a triathlon coach, too. Uh, and, you know, just giving up on that too quickly, I think, is a mistake sometimes. But anyway, let's just shift gears in here. And uh, let's, I mean, let's get into each each uh, discipline real quick, if you wouldn't mind. Okay. You know, sure. I think um, maybe you can talk a little bit about how you approach swimming and swim training for your athletes. Uh, you know, it, it's this, that's probably, I would say one of the biggest reasons, uh, certain athletes gravitate towards me is because of my, the success I've had, um, with athletes and kind of transforming their swim. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's actually the, the referral I got from this athlete today. She heard me on the different, the podcast I was a guest on the loss in transition podcast about swimming. And that's, mm-hmm. that's what gravitated her to me was, my approach uh just in general and training but was swimming and it's to simplify it yeah um you know i think she (laughs) she used the phrase that that i will now use again was that you know the bigger the mesh bag the slower the swimmer yeah you know the (laughs) the more (laughs) yeah and that's yeah it's uh the more tools you have usually the slower you are and that's because you're trying to focus on too many things and you're wasting too much time and you're doing it all slowly that the only thing you know how to do is train slow and be slow. Um, and you know, I, I had an athlete a couple of weeks ago who I just started working with who did my very first swim workout and was like, Oh my God, I've never worked that hard in a pool. And I didn't even have anything like super hard. Uh-huh. You know, there, there were no pieces of equipment. There was no gear. It was just, you need to swim fast. Mm-hmm. Don't think about your drill. Don't think about where to enter. Let's just get fast and let's be okay getting fast because anaerobic swimming sucks and it just does. Yeah. Um, you're just toast. Um, but swim wise, you know, I, I'd probably do focus on it a lot more than some other coaches just because I know how important it is. And I've also seen the success that my athletes have had. And I think that that just translate, not just from a time standpoint to taking you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes off an Ironman swim or five or six off a 70.3, it's their confidence. Mm-hmm. And that's priceless. It is priceless to be able to step up and be like, man, I'm about to crush this swim and I'm about to, and I'm about to rock it versus maybe the year before where they're thinking, oh man, I don't know if I'm going to make it. Like I, I'm kind of freaking out. Um, I can't imagine starting was such a huge important event um for so many people with that kind of mentality um yeah and that's just a part of erasing it but you know i'm a huge fan of the band paddles a pool buoy you don't need anything else um you can use them if you want to but you're wasting your time uh you know work hard work your upper body Um, correct your body positioning by strengthening your core and working on your kind of proprioception about where your body is in the water because it is very difficult for people Um, and simplify swimming to where you swim in a quadrant it's it's reach as far as you can before you enter the water get an early vertical forearm and then don't take your hands out of the water until the very last minute other than that don't think about anything else that's it Um, you know volume is good but but uh uh, intensity is just, if not more important, uh, swim wise. Yeah. Um, when I first started training with you and we went out, we would go to the lake and I think there's a video on that somewhere that we can kind of link to, but it sort of goes through your philosophy. But, uh, what we did and I know, I didn't know any different. And a lot of, there was a lot of people that 
we're more concerned with, like you said, volume. But what we would do is uh, we would swim a lot of sprints out to this buoy, which was about 100 yards away, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, swim out to it and swim back as fast as we could. And I think many times, you know, other than a little warm up we take, we do that maybe uh, with variations of uh, swimming with a lot of other people around and working on contact and doing that sort of thing. But we would basically bust our ass for 100 out and 100 back and whoever, you know, we would time it out. And you had us in different groups that would collide at the, at the buoy and make it real congested and things like that. But by the end of the day, we were, I don't know, maybe 1,200, 1,500 yards Oh, easy. Yeah, and, and you're talking a, a hard 1500. Yeah. I mean, and, and we, we got in real life race applications and created an environment that was just like a race, if not more chaotic and more stressful. Um, and you worked your butt off and you were trashed when it was over with. Yeah. Um, and obviously. And you, got, and you got your best bang for your buck. Yeah. And obviously it was open water, so we worked on things like sighting and just, it was that anxiety factor that really helped us uh, you know going into those swims with all those people around and and getting used to that was invaluable but and you'd have us but i mean there was a good stretch when we did that three days a week or th yeah three days a week and really that's all we were doing you know and you did supplement at different times with longer pool swims of course but uh i i remember everybody was kind of worried about you know not getting enough volume during a key training period but they couldn't translate the work that we were doing that harder work that intense work in the pool or in the lake as really all you needed or not all you needed but it was a huge part of the base and you know we didn't all we were all kind of new swimmers so we had only been doing it for about three or four months but we all did well at wisconsin a mass start and uh uh, I, I just felt like it was the best thing I've ever done. And I still will go out there on my own and more or less kind of channel those workouts because everybody's f fucking moved away. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm out there in the lake by myself or with, you know, a few strag stragglers <laughs> kind of just doing bullion backs. And this is what I did this year. And I felt like my swim, you know, especially with a little base behind me now. And while I was doing that, I was like, wow, man, I, I could just tell that it was coming and I would just really, you know, hammer it on my own. So, um, anyway, uh, so we can go on to biking. If yeah, you know. cycling. Uh, you know, I, I, cycling is one of those things where you, it takes a while to gain like the your I the most amount of fitness you can get. I mean, it, it takes years to uh, you know get to where you're just you got it. But once you've got it, you can pick it back up so much faster than any of the other two mm -hmm. um it just it just from a physiological standpoint it just comes back quicker i mean you can go from doing a couple one hour rides a week to of high intensity to four weeks later doing a, a couple high intensity workouts and a long three hour ride on the weekend i mean it's just it's just that it comes back up it, that quickly um i'm a huge fan of the trainer uh during the week um uh intervals uh and I really like to work athletes uh, two ways, you know, below, way below, and way above race pace mm -hmm. uh, from a from an effort standpoint, but then also way below or much higher than their natural race cadence. Um, you know, your longer rides are going to be in that normal cadence range anyway, whichever you're comfortable with. Some people like prescribe these ridiculous like 90 to 95 Lance Armstrong style art, you know, cadence. Uh, and, and that's just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm a huge fan of the lower cadence, not too low, but definitely lower, maybe 70 between 70 and 80. Um, and work big gear, 45, 50 RPM, big gear workouts, and then higher RPM stuff, just really working out the kinks and the pedal stroke, really making you an efficient cyclist, um, and, you know, with cycling, if you have the time, which a lot of triathletes don't, you know, more is always more. You know, 80% of the time, just go ride. 20% of the time, hit it hard. Um, if you're not one of those athletes that doesn't have that kind of time, like most of us, mm -hmm. um, the average age group athlete, you know, I usually prescribe two to three 
depending what what season we're in like for example if right now we're in the winter time in the for most of america is you're going to say hey uh, you know two or three hard trainer sessions a week is fine it's enough to keep fitness and it's enough to raise your threshold and make you faster um and once the year gets warmer then we'll do maybe one trainer session or two trainer sessions and then we'll ride as long as we can as much as we can on the weekends now, i'm a huge double bike fan um where that can either mean like on a tuesday hour and 15 in the morning hour and 15 in the evening two and a half at once on a tuesday not going to happen for most people two one hour and 15 minute workouts you could probably squeeze that in mm-hmm. same on the weekends i'm a huge fan of double long rides of a four and a half hour five hour ride depending on your the training distance uh four four and a half hour ride on a saturday four and four and a half hour five hour ride on a sunday um you know it's i think it's it's a lot more efficient from a time management standpoint um and if you want to run well you have to be able to ride well um your your run legs mean jack if you can't if you can't ride um and i think like i said from a time management standpoint you can find two hours in the week much more likely than you can to find five hours so do your long run in the middle of the week i I prescribe that for a lot of athletes is and we'll talk about running in a second but is uh you know saturday sunday is a super long ride and i usually will alternate that each week so uh, this saturday sunday it might be long ride saturday long ride sunday the next week it might be long ride saturday and then squeeze in a longer run on sunday but for the most part it's it's volume uh and it's always time i never give athletes distance and that goes for for running and cycling it's all based on it's all based on volume and time it's not based on distance cool so all right let's go into running then since you're just talking about it run wise you know it definitely differs for each athlete depending on their running history if they're new if they if they have an injury history if they're older you got to be a little more careful with how you incorporate run volume um i've had a lot of personal success with uh upping my run frequency um and that really took me to another level this last year to where i was able to bang out just long run after long run after long run um Mm -hmm. But I'm a huge fan of, you know, quality work during the week. And then when we do long runs, I'll never have you do a long run on back-to-back weekends. Um, it might even be, I, I mean, the closest you would ever probably do is 14 to 17 days apart. And the other side of that is I'm an even bigger fan of the, the split run. You go out and do an hour an hour in the morning and an hour and 15 hour and a half in the evening get in you know do them six to eight hours apart if you can get in two and a half hours of running but the physiological toll it's going to take on you is not even close to what you're going to do if you run two and a half hours straight um it's and even during the week 30 minutes in the morning 30 minutes in the evening you know it's it's frequency and building up that durability to be able to handle running hills and then hills you go to handle running you know, speed and threshold work and then being able to incorporate that and doing it longer. You know, there's, there's people who like to run short, who like to run fast and people who like to run long and you have to do both. You mm-hmm. know, you want to be able to run faster, but if you don't run for long periods of time, then your body's going to break down. You're not going to have the muscular endurance to be able to hold that form, uh, for as long as you can. We touched on it before, you know, the, the Ironman marathon isn't really how fast you go. It's about who slows down the least. Um, mm-hmm. and if you, and if you don't do those long runs and you don't build up that durability, well, you're going to slow down much, much quicker than the other person is. Yeah. I like that, man. Uh, I've always liked your run focus and I like the whole breaking things up, even though I have a lot of time, sometimes a long <laughs> run can just you be some, mentally... what, do you mean, what do you mean? You sometimes have a lot of time. You always got a lot of time. Well, you know, it depends on. If I'm uh, chasing my dream, my entrepreneurial That's dreams. That's true, man. Uh, you know, I can hashtag be, startup. Uh, you know, I was, I, I was, I. I think I work harder now than I did necessarily at my job, but I used to make more money doing it at my job. But I just wouldn't work half the day. But I'd be yeah. there. 
you know there was a lot of you know attitude problems with me but anyway um but still it's like that that's what i meant by that creative approach sometimes it's about you know it's just a lot more I, I guess accessible or even enjoyable to me to think about doing uh, you know like I think one of your things I love the we used to do those two hour or one hour split runs on Sunday a lot you know where, mm-hmm. you, where you you know prescribe um, one hour in the morning and then another hour like eight eight hours apart or something like that and mm-hmm. I can't remember but I think you had was it the first one was faster or the second one? Or was there sort of a goal in mind? Like, you know, as far as having it, it, a focus on those. Yeah, it all, I mean, the, you, the first one is it was usually faster. Okay. Um, the second one was just more about time. Okay. Um, but it really kind of depends on where you are, um, you know, in the cycle. Sometimes the closer you would get, um, you know, to your race, I would probably have you a nice, easy first hour. And then the one later in the day would probably be descending. You know, uh, shake out that the stiffness and the the fatigue from the early morning, and then try to build it to where you're going to end up doing a negative split. You know, which is really really hard to do for the longer you go. But that's usually another great long distance workout. Yeah, cool man. Um, so anything else you want to add on this? I think that it's uh, you know at least for me it's been huge to have you as a coach, as a sounding board, as a you know support system and I can't you know undervalue or overvalue that enough because it's uh you know it's one thing to kind of be out doing your own thing but just to have another eye on it another ear on everything is is such a huge part of the coaching relationship for me and so I don't know if you have anything else you want to add to this no no I just I uh you know I I do have a couple uh, additional spots open for the 2017 season so if you're uh, if you're listening and it's you yourself or you know somebody else uh that thinks they might be uh might be a good fit uh personality wise you know uh I shoot a shoot an email over to crushing iron and they'll put you in touch uh with me be happy to talk you through um where you've been where you want to go and why that is and uh see if we're a good fit you know it's it's that's half the battle being a good fit for an athlete and being a good fit for the coach so that's uh if you can get through that then you're usually gonna have a successful a successful relationship yeah and it, i think it's important to note that you're i mean you're not like a coaching farm where you're just trying to pull in as many people as possible you're keeping it uh manageable for your own life as well as being able to give them the attention they need and stuff right oh yeah yeah i used to coach like 30 to 40 plus a year um and now you know i've got a i've got another full-time job i'm married i have a four-month-old and i've got my own training uh but it's something that i love to do um i love the the physiological and the research and then and the nerdy part i guess um mm-hmm. and, I, and i even more like the the relationship part you know i i want you to hire a coach i don't want you to purchase a training plan um and that's uh that's kind of the the end of it i think all right well let's wrap it up again if you have any uh ideas for topics or you want to just ask some questions just shoot one out at uh, crushing iron at gmail.com is the email address and we're yeah. always ready to listen and explore new things absolutely and then, uh, if you have the time please give us a review on itunes let us know what you think uh, how you like the podcast and that way we can continue to improve and uh, make you guys happy yeah, good point. Get those reviews out there. We need those. I guess those are a big deal. That's what I keep hearing. I heard that on another podcast I was on. I was like, oh, we should probably be doing that. So, yeah, you guys should leave a review. And we appreciate it. All right, man. I guess I will catch up with you tomorrow. Maybe. Sounds good, man. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye.